So this is my home setup. Um, as you can see, I've got everything sort of laid out for the building of pedals. And today I'm going to be working on the EQD arrows, which I'm going to be building on strip board, which is also known as barrow board. Um, so I'm going to take you through that process. Now I've tried to lay out all the parts before I start the build. Um, since I've built before and I've done a lot of these pedals, I don't usually carry it out in this way. Um, I'm a bit more piecemeal. I have stuff on the computer in front of me and lots of stuff going on. But for the benefit of beginners, um, this is how I started out. Just print it out really large and make sure you've got all the information in front of you in case you make a mistake. Because when you're starting out, it's very easy to miss little things that you kind of take for granted earlier on. So hopefully I'm not going to miss anything that I take for granted usually, um, but I'm just going to dive right in. Um, so the first one on the top left, this big round one is a 100 microfarad capacitor. Now these are measured in farads, but that's actually quite a large value for most applications. So um, this one's 100 microfarads. Um, you'll see as we go through, there'll be smaller and smaller ones. Um, this one's a 10 nano farad and this one is 100 pico farad so they they become very small um, now this particular one uh, is polarized you can see from this layout that the the negative this is usually the one that's indicated for the um, this type of capacitor is is shown with a little band and you can see on the actual capacitor it's got a negative band there this type is electrolytic uh, they're usually polarized um, and for these particular capacitors, they need to be rated uh, sort of at least five volts higher than what you're going to be pumping in. So as you can see from the diagram, this is going to receive nine volts. Um, so you need at least 16 volts. This particular one is rated 25 volts, so it should be fine. Um, it's a lot to remember, uh, but you, you start to take these things for granted, as I've said, as you go uh, a bit further. So we'll move through the capacitors. We've got these 4.7 nanofarad and 10 nanofarad capacitors which are a lot smaller now you can see they're the box type these are non-polarized you can use pretty much any type but i prefer these box types because they uh, are usually roughly around the same size as you start to get larger values you get to sort of 220 and 470 nanofarads and even um uh one microfarad which are non-polarized in this in this particular package they start to get a little bit bigger um, but you can get some other types for example this is um, 100 nanofarads and as you can see it's a lot bigger and the problem is when you're starting out these can take up a lot of space on the board it gets crowded um, you start to get confused about where the legs are going etc so it's it's a lot better to just kind of save yourself the bother and get parts that are easy to use um, so this is what I've done now the smaller one this 100 picofarad um, again it's a different type this is a mylar ceramic, I believe. Um, these are all pretty much the standard size too. So whenever you get one, whether it's um, you know 1 PF or 470 PF, um, even going up to 1 NF, these are all be the same size. So it's really easy to put stuff where it wants to go when, you, when you're starting out building. So that's my recommendation there. Um, now next we will move on to resistors. Now these are the little blue ones. You might have seen brown ones. Um, those are different types. It really doesn't matter as long as you get a quarter watt resistor because um, it determines the size. Now I haven't got any half watt or one watt resistors or anything like that on hand. Um, but as you can imagine as, as the rating gets larger so does the size. Much like the capacitor I showed you. So um, these fit nicely in, and I find if you bend these at the body, um, either side, they'll fit in nicely um, four spaces apart. So, for example, as shown with the, with this 10M, you can see one, two, three, four. If I bend at the body, um, just at these points, it will fit nicely in there. So um, that's, that's how I prefer to work. Uh, but as I mentioned, the brown ones... Um, are a slightly different rating. It really doesn't matter which one you use for this application. For example, this one over here is a 100K resistor. Um, they're both the same. They're both the same size. The only difference is you've got a bit more of a tolerance. For example, these blue ones, 
even though it says 100k, it's within plus or minus 1%. So that means you could get between 99k and 101k. The difference is that these brown ones are within 5%. So you could get anywhere between 95k and 105k. Um, but as you'll see, it really, for most of these pedals, um, they're not a, an exact science in a lot of cases. So it doesn't matter if you're a few k's out or um, you know a few nanofarads out for the most part. Um, it's just how it goes. Um, and I forgot to mention resistors are non-polarized, so you can put them around any way. Um, I think the only major difference I found is that when you're looking at the color codes of these, the brown ones are a lot easier to read than the blue ones. Uh, but if you've got a multimeter, you can measure them anyway, and it doesn't really matter uh, which approach you take. So the next component, just trying to work out what we've gone through. Um, this is a transistor. Now you can see it's a three-legged component. Um, it's the only active component we've got, so it, to do its job, it needs a bit of power. Um, and uh, that's what we've got going in here is it's nine volts. So just to keep it short and simple, the schematic says a 2N5089, or the layout I should say, says a 2N5089 transistor. I don't have any, but I've got a 2N5088, which is very similar. It's got the same pin out, which means that when I hold it this way around, looking top down, we've got uh, a collector, a base, and an emitter in the right place. Sometimes they switch them around, so you really need to check the data sheets uh, for this sort of stuff. But that one should be fine. It's just got a little less gain, which means that there might be less chance of it getting as loud but um, I've been reliably informed this is quite a loud pedal so that shouldn't really matter. The only other thing is this protection diode. Um, I believe it's a protection diode. But um, anyway this uh, is a 4001 diode. These are polarized. What they do is they stop the current flowing in one direction. They only allow it to flow in the other. So um, they're quite important in the circuit and quite often times they act as say um, a protection so let's say you put the plus and minus terminals around the wrong way uh, in your pedal this will stop it from frying the circuit and it just fries the diode um, I've only got a 2N4007 uh, oh, sorry a 1N4007 um, but it's higher rated so it will really do the same job um, and the rest of the stuff is kind of peripheral. So as you can see I've got my strip board here. Um, I've cut it out to the right size so I can see that because it goes to M on the x-axis we've got 13 rows and it goes to G so we've got 7 up. Now the thing to remember about these and it catches a lot of people out is that we're looking top down here so imagine this piece of board is invisible. We're looking at it from this angle because we're seeing these components on the top of the board and then the strips are running below. So what happens is with these cuts and this jumper, um, they're on the, well the jumper's on the top but the cuts are on the bottom. So where you see the pattern of cuts and you flip it over to actually make the cuts, it's a mirror image. So it catches a lot of people out. Um, so that's one thing to remember. The rest of it really is, is like I said, peripheral stuff. So we've got our um, 10k B potentiometer, which is our level, shows how loud it goes. B just determines the taper, so that means that because it's a B, it's um, a linear taper. So it, when we turn it around, it just has a smooth incline. Logarithmic has kind of a different one, but we won't go into that now. Um, when we turn it on, we'd like it to actually light up to show us that it's on. So we've got an LED, um, a little socket for that LED and then a resistor to make sure that when we pump some power into that, it doesn't fry it and needs a bit of resistance to protect that because LED stands for light emitting diode, um, and that's what it is, so we need to make sure it's okay. Um, that is a power socket, so that's what we'll plug our power into. These two are mono jack sockets. You can use a stereo. Um, some people do. It grips the, um, the jack when you plug it in a little bit harder, and also... Um, it does allow you to use a battery as well um, and not drain it when you've uh, pulled, the, pulled the jack out of the socket, but we're not going to do that because I don't really like using batteries. Um, and we've also got a knob here so that we can stick it to the potentiometer to kind of rotate. Now the only other thing that I'm missing that I forgot to get was a 
stomp switch, which looks a bit like this. These are the ones I use, pretty cheap, but they're all the same. And this is what you'll be standing on to activate the circuit. Um, and there's a specific way of wiring it up to make sure that you can have a true bypass circuit, which means that when it's off, it's almost as if the circuit wasn't there. There's no load or anything. Um, so yeah, those are our parts. Now I've made the cuts, the mirror image as you can see, it's opposite, so I've measured that out carefully and I've used this tool, I basically took an old screwdriver and I fashioned it into a point, um, so what I can do is I can rotate it uh, and cut that trace very easily. You only really need to do this on Vero board or, um, or strip board, just going to get that a little bit out, and you can use a multimeter to test continuity so basically if you put one point of the multimeter on one side and one point on the other side and it's still beeping it means that there's still a connection there so you need to cut that connection and make sure that it's nice and clean so that you don't have any problems because if you start to try and use the pedal and there are problems I've had that happen to me in the past I've pretty much encountered every problem um, that you can imagine and it's almost always my fault. Um, so if ever you've got an issue with it not working, assume you've made a mistake because it's very easy to do. Now, um, what I'm going to do now is I've bent my component leg to make a jumper. I'm going to solder it. So I use a wet sponge to just clean the tip of my iron before I actually make the connection. I take the solder. I just heat the area very carefully. I don't want to use too much and I don't want to hold it on there for too long. Like I say, I'm not an expert. I don't have a degree in this or anything, but it does the job. Now you want to make sure that these are in the right place because you don't have to desolder them. Um, I find this variable board is quite resilient, but printed circuit boards aren't. So if you've got to keep repeatedly heating um, and removing and re-adding components on the traces, it will pull them up and then you've got a broken printed circuit board. And if you don't have a replacement, you're either left to struggle with it not working or you know you can try and fix it, but it becomes very, very fiddly. It's really not ideal. Um, so there you have it. Now I've soldered my two jumpers into place, I'm just going to snip the ends just to make it a little bit easier to navigate. So, use this little clippers. This makes it a little bit neater. Now I'm just going to start top to bottom basically. So I'll start with this 100 ohm, and then I'll move on to the 1M, 1.2, 10 m the 4001, and then the 100K. Um, you can see that I'm picking the components that will be most flush to the circuit board, um, because it makes it easier. When you're turning it upside down and you're trying to keep things in place, it's very awkward if you start picking tall components and then you want to get a really short component in between the two um, to hold it where it's supposed to be and then solder it in place. Um, so it's generally the preferred method to do it this way. Um, it doesn't matter which order you do it in. So as I said before, I just fold right at the body because I can see that this component is taking up one, two, three, four spaces. And I know from experience that that is gonna fit just where I want it. So it just pops in just above the jumper. Um, and as I say, these ones are non-polarized. So it doesn't matter which way around they go. So I'll push that in there. And then I flip it over. And I can solder those legs in there. Now, as you can appreciate, when I've soldered that, and I clip those legs off, and then I flip it over, I can do the next one. If I start picking capacitors, and then I decide to go back to resistors, it's going to sit up here, which is going to make the component fall out. Uh, it would just be a mess. So you don't want that. So I've soldered these flatter components. 
um, making sure that this diode has been wired in the right orientation because remember this one's polarized you can see that white band at the top corresponds to the white band at the top of here um, so the next thing we're going to do is focus on this one and then we'll probably move on to these larger capacitors again all of these are non-polarized and then lastly we'll focus on the 5088 transistor and also the capacitor which are both well that's polarized but that needs to be in the correct orientation as well so here I am soldering the last of these poly caps just quickly Oops. there we go what I should say is that you really need to clean your tip after every joint, um, not before, because it's assumed that it's clean before you start soldering. So your solder tip always needs to be clean, nice and tinned. You just about see it, but that tip needs to be nice and shiny. This is a pretty old soldering iron. I find it works well though. It's always been my go-to. Um, doesn't really matter what you use as long as it does the job and you can navigate and it doesn't make it too difficult for you um, by applying too much heat or having too large a tip. Now the next point, remember we're looking top down here, um, the next point we need to do is look at this transistor and you can see that there's one flat edge uh, which determines the orientation. Now you may wish to use a socket for this just if you want to swap it out or if you're not sure. Um, I'm not going to because I have enough experience that I know kind of what I'm doing but if you're not confident you may wish to use a socket I might actually demonstrate that so you can buy this single inline stuff which comes like this and you basically just snap it off and you have the desired number of little legs so you can you can easily snap off three like that and then what you do is you solder that component in and basically the the transistor just kind of slots in there he says and yeah it takes a bit of force to get it out so you know it's gripped pretty well um, but what that means is that if you're not sure whether the transistor is going to work or if it's the right way around if you're not sure of the pin out those sorts of things you can socket it um, I don't normally do it but I recommend socketing other active components such as integrated circuits usually op amps because it um, makes all the difference and I just poke it down as you can see it's a little bit higher than the rest and then you can also buy a little thing called a third hand um, which can hold your circuit board to make it easier for you to use both hands um, but that's what I'm actually using to hold my phone so I can film this so I'm not using it here, so it makes it a bit awkward, a bit of a jumble. So, as soon as I'm kind of bodging this one, just have a quick look to make sure those joins are alright. Missed that third one. There we go. And um, if you're not sure, you want to just run the end of your solder on the traces just to make sure you don't get any solder bridges between and then we can clip off these legs Oops. I have this little box just with a bunch of offcuts so that I can just snip bits and bobs into it and then when I'm done I just chuck the contents of the box into the bin makes it a lot easier now that I've arranged everything where I want it to go you can see there's not a great deal of room in here really um, there's going to be wires and stuff going around um, and yeah I've been doing this for a few years but if you're anything like me it's still going to be a bit messy um, it's just the nature of what it is so you know you've got to allow for that sort of stuff um, so yeah bear in mind that, that there really isn't a lot of space in these enclosures and you're going to need space to work around as well so when you're doing your soldering you don't want things getting in your way unless you really want to squeeze it into a small enclosure and you've had experience doing this stuff before so um, this looks like it would fit comfortably in a 1590BB so 
um, that's eventually what I'll do. So what, what I'll need to do then is mark out all the different points that I'm going to put my knobs and everything like that and drill it um, to make sure it's accurate. Um, but part of the reason for laying it out, now that I've just tipped it all out, is to measure the lengths of wire that you're going to use to make sure it's not too long or too short. So if it's too long, um, especially in high gain um, effects, if the wires are too close together, it can add a lot of noise. Um, and if obviously they're, if they're too short, then it's going to mean that those components don't stretch to the locations that you want them to be, and you'll have to cut the wires again, which is a bit of a pain. Um, so that's really the main reason for laying everything out, measuring the lengths of your wires that's going to go, um, and you can use this diagram or whichever wire and diagram you have uh, to work out where they're going to lead to onto the circuit board. So for instance, I can work out which way I'm going to want this, how I'm going to mount it. Um, and again, there are various different ways to, to mount within your um, your enclosure. You can use double-sided sticky. So I've got some flying around. So this is your double-sided sticky foam, and it would pretty much fit under there. Or you can use the wires, certain types of wires hold the circuit board in place. Um, otherwise, some printed circuit boards have little holes that are ready for these standoffs. So what you do is you get your circuit, you push the standoffs through, and then you can stick it to the base. Now I'm just going to try and wire everything up. I've got a selection of different colours of wire. You might not have this sort of selection, but um, as long as you can determine easily which wire is which, then if you have any problems uh, and it's sort of in the enclosure, even if it's working for a while and then something comes loose later on down the line, you can trace the wires and you can see where it's coming from and where it's going um, to see where the problems lie. And so that might be an option for you. I've just cut these wires for the power connections. Um, she's in red and black, pretty simple. Red for power, black for ground. Um, what I do is I cut the ends with I've got one of these type wire cutters. You can use whatever you want. Really, you can just use a, a blade. Um, the ones that I'm using are around 24AWG, which I think stands for American Weight Gauge. Um, but it's, it's pretty much consistent to fit through these little holes. So 22 or 24, is pretty much what you want to go for. I can't remember, I think it's something like around 0.6 of a mil. Um, so yeah, that should do you right. But I twist the ends and then tin them. So that means just getting a bit of solder. Um, uh, so when you, it's a bit like using wool and um, thread and a needle. You kind of, like where you, you lick it and twist it to make sure it stays in a point. It's the same sort of principle. You just kind of tin the ends um, after you've twisted them to make sure that they don't fray and you can thread them through here pretty easily. At this point I've tinned the wires and put them in as per my diagram. Now you can see that I use sort of colour code. I use black and red for positive and negative um, or positive and grand. Um, I use white for ins and outs and then I just cycle through the rest of the colours for the other connections. Luckily we've only got connections to one, two and three of the potentiometer, which um, makes it easy. When it gets more complicated and you've got switches and you know five or six controls and it starts to get very messy. Um, so when you look at a pot face on like this with the um, the shaft pointing upwards, that's where you've got number one, number two and number three from left to right. When you're looking back on, it's the opposite. So you've got three, two and one. Um, Usually when it's shown in diagrams and stuff like that, if you can see it looks like there's a shaft drawn on, you can assume it's one, two, and three. Um, if it's like that and there's no shaft drawn on, it's just a round circle, you can assume it's three, two, one. Uh, it's just how people depict it in the pictures. Um, also, CW and CCW uh, refer to counterclockwise and clockwise positions. So it might refer to your counterclockwise and your clockwise terminals, um, although I don't see that very often. What I'm thinking I might do is um, just whilst I'm wiring this up, I will run another ground wire because um, when you look at my diagram, you can see that there are no breaks in this line from ground. So I should be able to see ground. 
and it goes all the way across. There's no cut like that one. So I can safely connect another ground wire here and run it to something that needs to go to ground, which um, ordinarily I, I would do the red and the black to this and then run ground wires from that, but you can run it. There's going to need to be ground connections on this switch. And there's also, these have only got two connections. One of these, which is this one, is the um, input or output, the hot one. And then the other one, which is connected to this shaft, is the ground. So we can connect it to that also. Now the next thing is I want to wire this switch so that I can just join everything up. Um, and it has a couple of connections on it. You can see that these terminals on here are in a certain orientation. I, I like to have it this way around um, when I'm wiring the switch. There are loads of different ways of doing it. Um, but this is the one that I prefer um, just because I've been doing it for so long and it makes much more sense to me. Uh, so you can see this little ancient diagram that I drew years ago. Uh, this is what I still refer to. But this is where the connections are. You can see that these two bottom left terminals are connected to each other and the top left and the bottom right are connected to each other. Um, and then all the other connections come off from that. So the input from the circuit, the one that we've just wired, so this wire on the left comes in from here, will connect into that. And then the output from the other side of the circuit connects to that one. Um, and then the input jack and the output jack have their own connections. And this middle row uh, is separated for the LED to show the indication of that. Now you can see that these 3P DT or three pole double throw switches have a particular switching configuration. So when you switch it, it flicks between um, these two settings. So it connects two of those adjacent pins. Um, and what that means is it allows us to run three thin things independently. So with that one click, three different connections are made, three different switches are switched between. Um, and it means that we can, so we can have power going to the LED and it won't have to be joined up or connected to any other part of the circuit, but it will still be a simultaneous switch. So that's the benefit of that. Hopefully I've described that well enough. Um, so what we're going to do is make those connections um, between these pins and then we can start, start connecting up the rest. Here you can see I've soldered both these connections. The one on the bottom, I've soldered on both ends. This wiggly one I've soldered only at the bottom because you, you can see at the top the in jack is going to have to come in there too. So what I'll do is I'll make that connection at the same time as I um, make the connection for the wire. So that one is still unsoldered as you can see. So I've wired in everything except for the LED connections in the middle. Uh, the next thing is to start wiring the other jacks and pots and everything to the board. Um, now this DC jack, these particular types, they allow for you to be able to switch between a battery connection and a power connection. So what I do is I just fold that particular one over because that is for the uh, the battery connection. And this larger one on the left is your ground connection. And the one immediately on the right is the power connection. The other tip that I was going to give for jacks is... As I mentioned before, this, this metal core part is connected to ground. So this tab that you can see that's touching that is the ground tab. The one that is not touching that is connected to this, which is going to give you your guitar signal. Um, but for either connections, what you really want to do is heat up a bit of solder and um, tin these just sort of a bit like this, just get some solder and heat it on there so there's a blob there ready for you to go with. Because if you start putting them in situ and then starting to solder them in, it doesn't quite take as easily as some of the other metal connections. Um, so it's easier to prep those, I think. So I'm just gonna add these connections here. As discussed, it takes a little bit more heat unusual for it to take but once you've got these blobs on here it makes it a lot easier going forward 
So this is nice actually about this layout you've got output um, and then the level one, two and three are quite nicely lined up there. So all you need to do is get them lined up and you can solder them in quite easily. So I'm near the home stretch now. Um, just going to wire the LED and a point to make is that the shorter leg is the one that's connected to negative. The longer one connects to positive. The shorter side is also, um, the negative side is also denoted by a little flat point. I don't know if you can see it very easily in this video, but there is there will be a flat part um, on the LED, on any LED. Um, and so when you connect the resistor between um, either ground or positive, um, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be either one or the other. Um, as long as it's connected somewhere next to the LED. So here's the final point. I've connected everything up. The LED is connected. These jacks are connected to both ground and input and output respectively. There's some um, a power line going to the other end of the LED there. So don't forget that. And uh, everything else is nicely connected up to the circuit. So we'll test this out. So this is my test rig, um, don't make the mistake that I did because I just tested it and I thought I'd made a mistake but I plugged the input into the output and vice versa um, and it's not the first time I've done that. Here's a demo, so this is my clean tone. <laughs> Switch it on. But what you can hear as I crank it up, that's a little bit of gain and a lot of volume. thing that I like to share with people um, got a bunch of circuits sitting around doing stuff gathering dust um, some of these I've most of them actually I haven't just I've just been lazy but for a while I had a bunch that I couldn't get to the bottom of um, so I thought well what is my debug and troubleshooting process because it's really important to get this right it's what puts a lot of people off making these simple mistakes um, and so what I decided to do is make a, a list of 12 points that would really take me from start to finish through actually troubleshooting and then yeah different issues that I had and what actually resolved the problem in, in the case of these builds um, so the first one is that you haven't got it plugged in essentially number two is that your cable is not plugged in or your guitar volume is down I've done that before um, number three is the pedal volume or gain is down or the settings are incorrect so one time I built a uh, um, a pedal called the ugly face and I thought it was broken but it, uh, it was on a setting that's supposed to sound like that it's just that you know through the through the testing process I didn't realize that um, so I rebuilt the whole thing and then realized I'd done it correctly in the first place which was quite disheartening um, the number four the input and output leads are swapped I just did that and number five semiconductors are socketed components and not seated so um, if you do use a socket uh, and you get really really keen to test your um, pedal then what happens is you tend to plug it all in turn it on and then you realize you forgot to plug your chips in <laughs> um, the sixth one is trim pots so some some effects come with a little um, potentiometers that are attached that are mounted directly to the board for a set and forget type thing and sometimes the, the reason is that the effect doesn't work when they're in certain settings um, so if you've got them in those particular settings where the circuit doesn't work it's not going to work so um, if you have trim pots on your build always give them a twiddle um, number seven is a grounding error this is very common and it can happen anywhere so you see the number of grounds that are connected and the fact that if any point that is going to make sound is connected directly to ground it will cut the sound it just won't work um, and that can happen where you wire the switch wrong everything like that so um, you know, as, as I mentioned, making connections um, between the board and the enclosure. So, yeah, that stuff can really 
make a difference um, and be common. Uh, you can always check, con check continuity with a um, multimeter. Um, so off-board wiring errors, so leads going to the wrong places. Number nine, solder bridges and traces not cut. So that's problems with stuff going on on the board. Um, number 10, incorrect component position. So you've put the components in the wrong place. Number 11, um, the components the wrong value or tolerance with resistors that look very similar uh, or the same. It's really easy to make that mistake if you don't test them. So you can have a really large resistor in place, a really small one or vice versa and all stuff your circuit up. Um, and the last one is failed components. This is uncommon, but it does happen where you think, oh, it's definitely my fault. And then you realize you've got a dud component. Um, and the last thing to do is to check the audio signal with an audio probe. I'm not going to go into that here, but it's a really, really good idea to do. And if you look up what an audio probe is and how it works, um, if you really can't find the error after going through all those points, uh, it's, it's a great place to actually resolve stuff. And it's worked for me a lot of times. Hope that's been of help to you.